Hello, everybody. Here is another workshop on our November series. And this time we have Ben Sless talking about transducers. Oh, hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. Welcome to the Structure and Interpretation of Closure Transducers workshop. My name is Ben. I love Clojure. I have been programming Clojure professionally for the past three years as a backend engineer at AppsFlyer. I have been programming professionally in Clojure for the past three years as a backend engineer at AppsFlyer. And before we get into the workshop, why transducers? Why do we have them? Why do we need them? Transducers give us more general building blocks. We want code reuse because code reuse is good. We are able to use these abstractions and building blocks in different contexts. And we will also have a bit more beautiful code. Also, and that's a, an important bit, we are able to then decomplect processing from everything else. And Everything else, we'll see exactly what that means, but how it plays out is, for example, looking at map and filter. Why can't we map and filter over everything? We can do it over sequences, uh, like the closure core library sequences, but why not over Java collection or over new objects, over channels, from core async over manifold streams, over util concurrent flows, over core logics streams. We don't want map and filter to be an ad hoc implementation every time from scratch, because the idea of what map and filter do is independent of those things. Also, transducers give us better performance. Uh, they gave us control over the execution context between laziness and eagerness and different degrees of laziness. They give us less allocation and they are more JIT friendly. Now in this workshop, we will be implementing and deriving transducers from scratch. And transducers are a naturally emergent property of reducing. So the first step in this learning process is to implement reduce ourselves. And hopefully once we have done so, uh, we will internalize these ideas and those processes. And by that, we'll be able to understand transducers better. Again, before jumping in, now is a time for questions if there are any. All right, so <clears throat> reduce. Reduce takes three arguments. It takes a function, which takes an accumulator and element, and it returns an updated accumulator. It takes an initial value for that accumulator, and it takes a collection to take these elements out of. Now to implement reduce, let's write out in words the algorithm. We are iterating over the elements of a collection. If we have consumed the entire collection, we return the accumulated accumulator. If we have not, we combine the accumulator with the head element using our function, and we iterate again with the updated accumulator and the rest of the collection. Now, this translates directly to code. And I even left in the comments, uh, which map directly to the text. If we have not consumed the entire collection, right? The seek check returns nil if the collection is empty. Let's assume it is not empty. We take apart the head and the tail of the collection. We use the reducing function to combine the accumulator and the head element. 
and then we recur with an updated accumulator and the rest. If the collection is empty, thus this returns nil, we hit the accumulator and we return it. And this is a version with less annotations. Now let's check if this works. We can accumulate a number, right? We are using plus as our function. We start from zero. We have a vector of numbers and we can sum them. We can also accumulate a collection. We can use conj. We take an empty vector as an initial value and we accumulate the values into it. Now, if we pick a different initial value, we might get a different behavior. Here, for example, when we accumulate into a list using conj, the list grows at the front. Now, there are some implications to this, but a very important one is that we can implement reduce using linear recursion. And that means loop. And this relationship goes both ways, i.e. Everything which we can implement with reduce, we can implement with recur. Everything we can implement with recur, we can implement with reduce. Now, there is one little hole in this assumption, which is early termination, which is why closure gives us the reduced predicate, which allows us to break early. And this covers basically everything we can do with reduce, we can do with the loop. Any questions about this part? Now it is a time for questions. Just a little thing about the implementation detail I have a question on. Um, I see in the let block for the reduce function, you've got head and tail. And so when destructuring that, that will actually take the first and the rest? Yes. Oh, OK. Because uh, yeah, I've, uh, I've just never used um, destructuring that way. I didn't know that was possible. Yes, uh, destructuring. Uh, works for sequences mm. in, in this way. And this uh, syntax specifies like the rest of the collection gets packed in tail. OK, no. All right, that's, that's, all, uh, that's all I had to ask. All right. Any other questions? <clears throat> all right, then. Now we have a little new tool in our tool bed. We have our own little reduce. Now let's look at the problem from another angle and we're going to implement map and filter from scratch. And again, we're not going to care about um, efficiency, only correctness. So let's start with map. Starting from a very straightforward implementation with a loop, right? I have some return accumulator, which I'm going to build up. I have a function, which I map over a collection. I check if the collection is empty. If it is not empty, I destructure the collection and I conj into the accumulator, the function applied to the head element of the collection and the rest of the collection. I think I might have Yes, I have accidentally corrupted the code here. I will correct it later. But yes, there's an error in the code now. 
but we can still convert it to reduce. Now, we have said previously that loop and reduce are equivalent. So we can rewrite our map implementation using reduce. Now, it might be inconvenient to follow those steps. So I have put those implementations side by side. Now assume that here in the map in the loop bindings, I should have bound the collection as well. That's my mistake. I forgot to bind it. Now here we have the reduce implementation. And here we have the map implementation. And we can see they're pretty similar. In both, we have a check if the collection is empty. In both, we have some accumulator we are building up. And in both, we have the destructuring and the recursion with an updated uh, accumulator and the rest of the collection. Only that in reduce, we also bind the function. And then juxtaposed with the reduce implementation, we can sort of map the body of this function to what we see on the left-hand side, right? It sort of makes sense. The reducing function, which we pass to reduce, is this little part here, the part which conjures into the accumulator, the function applied to the head element. Now also would be a good time for questions. All right. Now we can do the same with filter. Here in filter, I don't have that typo. I remembered to bind the collection correctly. So again, we start with some return accumulator, a collection, we check if it's empty. If not, we destructure the collection. We update the accumulator. Now, what do we do in filter? If some predicate applies to the head element, we collect that element. Otherwise, the accumulator is unchanged. And then we recur with the updated accumulator and the rest of the collection. And again, we can convince ourselves that this works. Same way, here I don't have the picture of those uh, side by side. We can convert filter to be implemented using reduce. Again, the same body of the reducing function. Here, we have the head and the returned accumulator. Maps directly to here. The accumulator and the head are passed to this body. And the implementation gives us the same result. Now, there is an important invariant in both of these cases, which is important to remember. There is always one thing which decreases or gets smaller and another thing which grows in this process. The reducing process ends when the decreasing quantity reaches some zero value. And we return the accumulator we have grown up instead. In reduce, call, the collection, decreases, and the accumulator increases. And we can accumulate a collection or a number. Doesn't matter what, but it will always grow or be updated in some way. And we have seen the same with map and reduce and filter. An accumulator which grows, sometimes conditionally, and some source which shrinks. 
and we will use this invariant as a property, which will also allow us to derive transducers. <clears throat> now is another time to break for questions. All right. Now, you probably noticed that the implementations for map and filter using reduce looked pretty familiar. And they're so similar to each other that they are the same besides some common core we can refactor out. Here, this is maps core. And then map implemented with reduce uses this instance of map core and calls reduce on it and we get map working as expected. And here we can see the before and after for the refactor. All right, we just pulled out this function, which we passed reduce, gave it a name, and instead of closing over f, we turned it into an argument. Is everything okay? Any questions regarding this transition? Good so far. Good. Now, again, the same refactor with filter. We pull out the reducing function. We turn the predicate into an argument instead of closing over it and we gain the same looking implementation. Now those core functions are completely separate from the notion of where the elements come from, right? Let's look at this function. It doesn't know anything about the source of element anymore. It knows how to accumulate, but it has no clue where the elements are coming from. It is being driven from outside. So there are two, two forces here, right? We've factored out consuming, but just like we pull elements from somewhere, we still have a concrete implementation of how we push the elements into the accumulator. But just as we have done for pulling, we can do the same for pushing. Instead of using conj at this point, let's just say it's another function. Let's call it grow. And use it as an argument. And in our implementation of map, we will pass conj as an argument. Again, side by side. Here, we have conj. Here, it's an argument we call grow. And here, map core has an extra argument added to it. And now map core doesn't really know how to grow the accumulator either. <clears throat> now, for some reason, we will see later, there's a slightly more interesting way of writing it, which is to curry the arguments instead of taking both the fun function we're mapping and the grow function. We first take the function we're mapping and then later we will take the grow function. The rest of the behavior is absolutely the same. Again, 
side by side, this is the before. We took both F and grow. Now we take F and later we take grow. And you can see the, uh, the part where we call map core. Here we passed two arguments and here we first pass F then we get back a new function, and then we give it conj. Any questions about this part? Um, can, we, uh, can we understand a little bit of why we'd want to do this? Um, like, why would you want to, um, why would you want to move all this functionality out of map itself i maybe you mentioned it but i don't really get that purpose i haven't mentioned it yet but we are currently at the precipice of transducers now just uh, to spoil it a little if you look at the map core once you give it a function like the the function that you're mapping mm -hmm. you get something back which knows how to map that function given grow and reduce. So you have abstracted the notion of mapping completely from everything else, right? You, mm. you take some function, let's take inc, for example, increment. Mm. So once you pass increment into this thing, you get something which maps increment over anything. I don't know what. That behavior is TBD. Oh, so this, uh, this allows you to um, use any collection you want to, um, to map over? Yes, and. Hmm. Now we can do exactly the same for filter, uh, but in this part, no pictures. <clears throat> now, this exactly uh, goes back to your question. This is interesting, but why did we do this? We have derived two higher order functions, and they still like obey all the rules we have about reducing uh, functions and reducing processes. But at this point, they know nothing about the implementation of reduce. They don't know how to grow the collection and they don't know how to consume the elements. Those are behaviors that they are parameterized on. The part for consuming or pulling elements into the function is handled by reduce. And the part which accumulates is now handled by grow. So what we're left with is a function representing only the computation itself. <clears throat> and that's what we're left in with in isolation. We have functions which take other functions as a parameter, right? Map takes a function which returns a value. Filter takes a function which returns a a predicate, it takes a predicate which returns a truthy or falsy value. Later, they will take grow and they return a function which has some behavior. Now, grow should also have some properties which are essential for all of this to work properly. Now, grow. If you'll notice, takes an accumulator and an element and returns an updated accumulator. Here again, grow takes an accumulator and an, and an element and returns an updated accumulator. So it is another sort of function we can give to reduce. And we call those functions reducing functions, and we will see them usually in arguments abbreviated as RF.
Now, the most important part in grow is the step stage, right? It takes an accumulator and element and it updates an accumulator. But we also want some notion of beginning and end to the process. In the beginning, we might want to, for example, create an initial value. And this allows us to cover the two arity uh, case for reduce, right? We can create the empty collection we are accumulating. You can try it at home, call conj with no arguments, you'll get back a vector. In the end, we might want to tie a little bow uh, around the thing we have accumulated. We want to do some final step uh, if we might have used a transient instead of an immutable collection, we will want to call persistent when we're done. And that is something we can do in the end. Generally, a reducing function edits zero arity, returns an initial value, when it takes only one argument, it does something to finalize the accumulator. And the step arity, which is the most interesting arity, is where it performs some combination of the accumulator and the element. For example, like I mentioned with transients before, the initial value we return can be a new transient vector. The accumulation step can be conj, but this is a transient conj. And at the end, we will call persistent on the transient vector. Now, I have renamed grow to RF, And we have a new implementation of map, which is exactly as before, but here we create the initial value by calling RF to create the transient vector when we begin. And in the end, we call it on the result to turn the transient vector into a persistent collection. Sorry, could you scroll up there for a second? Yes, please. Uh, oh yeah, I just wanted to check if RF is a, is a global def. Cool, thank you. Yes, sorry. It was not a parameter yet. But now we can put the two implementations side by side and we can see how they map, right? Instead of grow, we have RF, which is still a parameter. But here, Inside map, we know RF globally, and we're using it instead of conj. And we're also using it to create the initial value, which we didn't before, and we call it in the context of the final step, which we didn't do here. Now, something important to keep in mind is that let's take map core for example we give it f we give it rf we get back another reducing function it behaves it obeys the same semantics for reducing functions right because what do reducing functions do they take an accumulator they take an element and they return an updated accumulator. Now we have already said that RF is a reducing function, which that is what it does. But the function we return here takes an element, takes an accumulator and returns an updated accumulator. So we're taking a reducing functions, we are returning a reducing function. 
Now, this pattern is very useful. And let's do a bit of home improvement and move things around. Here's what we did with map before. I just bound the intermediate values to names. We create map core, we get back some function. That function is invoked on RF, and we get some new RF. Then we reduce with it, and we call with RF in the end. And I think actually that should be RF tag. But yes, we those are the steps of operation we've performed. And again, if we put those two side by side, we can just say that I bound them to names. Nothing else changed. And suddenly, we have transducers. Now, this is a DIY implementation of transducers. It's not perfect. But we can implement map with it. But what changed here? What's different? So again, I'll put those two side by side so we can look. Here is map from before. It took a function, an initial value, and a collection. And here we called map core and got this magic function. Now, instead of knowing how to create this magic function, I'm going to take to turn this magic function into a parameter. I'm saying, I don't know how to use this magic function, but I count on you, the user, to give it, to provide it for me. Now we have created our magic function here before with map core over f. So if we use this arity, we can just pass map core for our little transformation function. Does this step make sense? Yeah, it's pretty clear. Excellent. Now, this is very close to closure core transduce. It takes x form, which is instead of the magic function, it takes a reducing function, an initial value, and a collection. And this is taken straight out of the uh, doc string for our transduce. It performs reduce with a transformation of the reducing function. It transforms it using this x form, which we will see in a minute. f should be a reducing step function, like we said. And it accepts both one and two arguments. And it returns the result of applying the transformed function to the initial accumulator, and then the first item in the collection, the second item, etc. Now, everything about this should be clear besides our little special function. We need to understand what it is and what exactly does it do. Now, like we mentioned previously, it takes a reducing function and it returns a new reducing function. So it is a transformation of a reducing function. In closure, we call those transformations transducers because they transform reducers. Closure 
conventionally, you will see them used as either as XF or X form in code and arguments. <clears throat> now, now is an excellent time to take questions before things get even more complicated. This is probably the gnarliest part. So, uh, so just to reiterate, I guess, um, <clears throat> this, uh, this trans, this transform, um, or wait, no, that's not what I wanted to ask. So a transducer is now, um, is something that, uh, transforms a reducing function into another reducing function. Yes. Okay, and uh, in the in the case of map, um, you would be you'd be taking um, I guess the reducing function would be I'm just looking back at the slide here. I can um, just go back. Yeah, stepping back a bit. We are looking for map core. Actually, here it is. Okay, so it would be that map core again, but you could but you could swap that reducing function out um, and uh, make it something else. Um, I don't exactly know why uh, or what cases you would want to do that, but okay, that now I sort of have it in my head. All right. Your your objective is really to make a map core function and then pass it to transduce, um, and that map core, core function is going to be something that transforms the reducing. Wait now. Yes. Uh, yes. What yeah? what does map core do? It closes over a function, mm -hmm. right? The function can be everything. It can be an increment function. But it can also be a JSON parse string function, mm -hmm. right? Then it takes some function that tells it how to accumulate. Maybe you're accumulating into a vector. Maybe you're accumulating into a set. Maybe you're accumulating a string, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not asking questions. You're the one who decides in which context you're accumulating things. Oh right. So if you if you have a different uh, if you have a different scenario, a different kind of thing you're accumulating, you would want to change this reducing function accordingly. Exactly. Let's just imagine, for example, you can accumulate into a channel. A channel mm -hmm. is an accumulator-ish thing, isn't it? Yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So transducers were originally uh, like the name was introduced to me as as sort of like uh, like my understanding was that it's like the name was chosen because it's like this generalized concept of like carrying values over right the 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 transform reducer thing is actually pretty interesting because like that's a like that's a technically true thing about the implementation detail right um, like in the re returning of the function. Mm -hmm. um, which I hadn't actually thought of before. Yes, and it is a technically correct name, but mm -hmm. it is also where transducers come from because mm -hmm. um, people from the core team can correct me if I am mistaken, but in the history of Clojure, they found out that they were re-implementing map and filter for every new context. For example, in core async, you had re-implementations of map and filter, and it was pretty silly because you why should you have to? Right? Why is and imagine that in core async you suddenly uh multiply your uh option space because you can map from a collection into a channel, but from a channel into a collection. Mm -hmm. So what now I have to implement map 
both for that direction and the other direction. Then closure will have three implementations of map. At some point, it has to jump out at you and say, stop, you're repeating yourself. And there's some core principle where you might not want to, right? There's the, the, the idea of mapping, the notion of mapping is completely independent from what you're mapping on and where those values are going in the end. Yeah, so so like in that that sort of transduction, right, across exactly. you know one arbitrary thing to another arbor, arbitrary thing is like where, yeah. Um, and this applies to everything streamy, right? You can consume from Kafka, for example, or we you can consume from any queue, right? This is can be a source of elements, and you can produce to any queue. This can be your producing function that you start with, right? The one that you're wrapping. And we'll get into this now. So one interesting property is that because, because those are transformations from reducing function to reducing function, you can compose them. Right? I have reducing function A to reducing function B. Then I have a transformation from reducing function B to reducing function C. Just like in any case of functional composition, I can cut out the middleman and compose the transformations. So for example, it would look like this. Now I have dropped the core pretense because both map and filter have an arity where they don't accept the collection and they return a transducer. So I'm just going to be using the map and filter implementations from core. We can compose them, but an interesting question is in what qu order do these transformations apply, All right? Because in compose, the final quest the final function is the first function applied but what about functions which are themselves transformations of functions this gets a bit complicated now there are slides here that i'm going to skip over they are here for completeness i have done step-by-step -step substitution you can go over it yourselves if you would like. I will not go over it here live because I don't want anyone to drop from vertigo. But the analogy is relevant. The order of application is actually identical to how sequence transformations would look like if we used chain last. Now, let's understand why. Transformations of functions are like craps, but not burritos. Each transducer, we've said, is a transformation which takes a reducing functions and returns a reducing function, transformed. So it wraps a reducing function with more behavior and another wrap and another wrap. So when we reduce, we have to go through all those wrapping stages in our way to the initial reducing function in the end. Now, I will sh just show you the result of the substitution. This is map in can filter even. And you can see we have some inner function, but the inner function is only called after we have called ink, right? This is the function which wraps RF and then we wrap it with 
ink, right? We wrapped with even and we wrapped with ink. But if you go through all the steps of substitution, you will find that ink is applied first. Just like it would be if we performed sequence transformation. So when we write out transducers, it's easier to think about it like if I sent a collection through this pipeline with thread last, this is how it would look like, just without the collection. So the last wrap is the last, is the first one you go through, right? It's a stack of wraps. And they give us some sort of composable transformation of pipeline elements. Now, well, first let's take a few more minutes for questions because now is also a good time for questions. Yeah, I had a question. Just wanted Please. to to revisit. So we've gone over the basics here of transducers and, and how they're made. Um, and at the outset, you mentioned that there's this equivalence between uh, loops and these reducing contexts. Yes. Um, can we can we recap the the what's the salient point there? I know that. Folks coming from other languages may be more familiar with looping constructs than you know map and reduce. And so, is your point there that um, if folks are familiar with problems from other languages that they would equate with a looping thing? Um, if if they're dealing with this uh, growing and shrinking uh, idea in that problem, then it might map to transducers, and then they can compose those. All right, so it's a good question, and let's go through the uh, genealogy of what we've done here. We've shown that loop and reduce are equivalent, and we can implement using reduce things we have, can implement using loop. Then we went with a pretty naive implementation of map and filter with loop. That was our starting point. And then we have shown that you can take those transformations with loop and transform them to trans to reduce. Right. And that, that's where the, the whole process starts, right? Once you have taken, because especially for people who are relatively new to closure, implementing things with loop, including map and, uh, and filter might seem easier, right? So, I wanted to start by showing that even if we start with map and filter implemented with loop, they naturally translate to an implementation with reduce. And once that happens, you can pull out some behavior and we, you can start taking it apart and taking it apart further and decomplexing the accumulation and the source of elements and you're left only with a process, with a notion of a process. Mm -hmm. And if we map that back in our heads to the loop, kind of what we're doing is we're composing those transducers into a, a given uh, cycle of the loop. Right? Yes. All of those transducers are just one step. Gotcha. And that, that's like one thing I really like about them is that it's just the computation, nothing else. And since they, they're the distilled concept of mapping, of filtering, we can just take it and apply it to anything which is reducible or anything we can accumulate. And reduces defined with protocols, right? So we can even 
extend those protocols to anything we feel like. And immediately we can use transducers with it. <clears throat> Let's say core async, for example. Channels are sequence-ish with time added as a bonus, but they are not sequences. But if they tell us how to reduce over them, we can immediately use everything we had for transducers on channels. And now in core async, all the implementations of map and filter are deprecated because it only provides an implementation of reduce and transduce because you can do everything else with it. And if we had an extension of the reduce protocol to channels, or if they just implemented it, we wouldn't even need those. So feel free to open an issue in uh, ask closure and then Alex can, uh, <laughs> can come complain to me. What have you done? <laughs> and channels themselves, they are something we can accumulate into. Putting it in a channel is a reducing function if it returns the channel, right? It's an accumulator, an element. We put the element in the accumulator. If we return the channel, voila, it's a reducing function. So if we put transducers on a channel, again, we'll get the same behavior when putting into the channel the elements will get transformed as if they have gone through this transducer. This is a transducer at the sink instead of at the source. And we can even find an equivalent to closures uh, into. Right? If we use onto chan from some collection, as long as this channel has a transducer on it, this is like closure core into, which also takes a transducer. So we get the same behavior. And if our transducers are stateless, there is no reason the, since we have just distilled the notion of computation and the computational process, we can perform them concurrently because why not? And then we can use the pipeline functions to, func to some channel, from some channel, through a transducer with concurrency of n. Because if I map some function over a collection of elements, it can be performed independently Right, there is no need to know anything about the other elements. So it can be performed concurrently. And now any question about uh, core async before I show something even weirder? Um, so these, um, these uh, core async has its own reduce and transduce implementations. Correct, but in theory, it doesn't need them. Ah, oh, okay. Right, because you could implement reduce over uh, a channel, right? A channel could implement reduce, and then right. you wouldn't need this anymore. Okay. And oh. it's, it's probably just a historical holdover at this point. I see. Um, now, um, is it important to know what this pipeline function does exactly? Because I have no idea. Just looking at it, I'm not sure. Um... All right. So I'll just explain very briefly. It mm -hmm. takes elements from a source channel, from, and it takes them through this transducer pipeline, right? Just like you would perform some sequence transformation map 
ink, filter, even. That's a transducer. So you pull the elements from the from channel, you shove them through this transformation into the to channel, and you can do it concurrently. Oh, OK. So that n is like kind of like a buffer right there. No, that's the number of threads. Number of th Oh, OK. OK, that makes more sense. All right. Also, uh, we're going to talk about stateless and stateful transducers later, but it might be good to call out here that um, when pipelining, you want to use <clears throat> stateless transducers. Right? Yes, uh, if you're using in the context of concurrency, beware state, right? It's up to you to, to know what you're doing, but don't use stateful transducers with pipelines. All right, thank you. Now, what else can we reduce on? And as I was writing the workshop, I had a weird idea. Should we or can should we be able to, or is it possible to reduce over a completable future? Now, in case you're not familiar with a completable future, uh, it's like a promise in JavaScript. It's a stage of computation which will be completed sometime in the future. And you can then apply a function to its result. So for example, I take some completable future which contains the value one, then I call inc on the result. And if I get the result, I get back two. Makes sense. Now I will just reach into closure core protocols and extend the reduce protocol to completable future. And, and I tell it, look, how, you, how do you reduce over a completable future? Just call then on it. The final uh, ingredient is to know how to perform some initial step, right? We need an initial reducing function. Now here, there, what's interesting about the reducing function is that it's very not interesting. The uh, initial value it provides doesn't really interest us. And in the end, we just want to get the content of the uh, completable feature. We want to look what's inside the box. And the actual step is to just not change the completable feature. The updated accumulator is the previous completable feature. And something weird happens. Suddenly, I can transduce with how I defined to reduce and step over a completable future. And I was surprised that this worked. And I, I threw in some sleep and cats. And everything worked. And I'm not even sure what are the possibilities with this, but it seems to me that we can take the notion of transducers and transducers as an abstraction of computation and actually apply it to many more things we haven't considered yet. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's one of those uh, serendipitous moments. So uh, future, for anyone that's not aware, it's spawning a new thread, right? This actually doesn't. This doesn't have asynchrony. So what's happening here with this completable future? Um, think about it just as a stage of computation. And when it completes, you can 
tell it here, this is the what you're going to do next. But if I wanted to do this asynchronously and I have tried it, instead of calling then apply, I would have called here then apply async. And in the step implementation, I would have provided an initial implementation of uh, an executor service, a thread pool, uh, colloquially. And then it would be the initial value that the uh, completable future is called with. And then I would have true asynchrony. It would happen in another thread. So it could happen on the same thread, might happen on different threads, and just depends on yeah. the executor. If you give it a thread pool, and you tell it then apply async, it will happen on that thread pool. If you tell it just then apply async, it will happen on the default thread pool. But you can just swap out then apply with then apply async and you will get asynchrony. I wonder if this could uh, map to promises on the Closure script side. Probably. Nice. Uh, you can look at libraries like Promessa, which do pretty similar things, but they the, the implementation even calls then map. But we have seen that map is just a, a, a slight concretion down from some core of map and reduce. So yes, you could absolutely implement reduce on promises in the uh, closure script. Interesting. <clears throat> now, as we have previously mentioned, uh, something we haven't touched on is keeping state between iterations. And sometimes we want to keep state. Uh, when we're working with loops, we can just add another variable binding. But with transducers, we have to cheat slightly. We have to close over a mutable value. Now, uh, by closing over, I mean that we will return a function that has captured some other mutable value, which we have defined outside of that function. As an example, we will start with map indexed, which is a pretty, it, it, I think it's the simplest uh, example of a stateful transducer. Now in map index, we need an index. Besides that, everything should be similar to map. Now, how should we keep track of this index? We need to be able to mutate something. Now, closure doesn't let us just mutate values, but it does have managed reference types. One of those, uh, at least in the JVM implementation, is volatile. It gives us back a reference, which has volatile semantics. We won't get into exactly what that means on the JVM, but we can use vswap to mutate the value. I have created a volatile around zero, and if I deref it, I get the value. If I call vswap, I, have, I get back the updated value. And now that I deref it, I can see that the value was indeed updated. May I ask uh, why, uh, why you wouldn't use an atom? I know you don't want to get into the details and uh, semantics of volatile, but uh, uh, why would not atom be OK? Is it only for performance reasons? Uh, an atom would be OK. But yes, the performance of volatile is better than an atom. And you will see that uh, most implementations in Clojure Core, I think all of, all of the stateful transducers use volatile. You, you don't need atomicity, right? You don't need the guarantees that if the transaction failed, you're going to try again. True. Thank yeah, you. You just want some place that you can update. OK. Now, I am going to need the value before the update, uh, not after. So 
I'm going to wrap it in a little macro. I'm going to first capture the old value. Then I'm going to perform the swap and then return the old value purely for my convenience. And now we can look at the implementation. <clears throat> Map indexed takes a function, returns a function which takes a reducing function, right? It's a transducer. First thing we're going to do, we're going to create the reference to a volatile. Then we're going to return a new reducing function, right? That's the, that's the name of the game. We take a reducing function, we return a reducing function. What does it do? In the zero arity, we finish. So we call the reducing function with nothing. We don't need to do anything special here. At the, that's the initial uh, arity. At the final arity, again, we don't need to do anything special. So we just pass it on to the reducing function that we wrapped. But at the step function, now let's remember what behavior map index guarantees. The function that it takes, takes two values. It takes the index and the value from the uh, sequence. So vswap val will return the index specifically before calling increment. And here we have the element. We apply f to that and we continue the accumulation. And here we can see that it works. Vector will take two arguments here. It will take an index and one of the elements. Our elements are keywords. And here we can see we get back a sequence of vectors with the index and the elements from the collection. Now, if, if we don't want to use reference types for some reason, we can roll our own types, right? We can create our own counter, for example. Now, this is some pretty specific closure JVM implementation. I create a type with a member. I tell it that it's an integer and that it is unsynchronized and mutable. And then I'm going to implement uh, the function interface, which lets me call invoke on the counter. And I can update the member inside this class and get back the previous value. And for example, how would I use it? I instantiate the counter, I get the index, it's zero. I call it like a function because I implement the interface for a function and it returns the previous value, but the counter was incremented. And then I can just use it as before. So you can use your own custom types. You can use the reference types uh, offered by Clojure. Both approaches are valid. And this might be more readable, but the implementation of counter may be less readable. So it's your decision. Uh, where which direction you want to opt for. Any question about this before we move on? Anyone? All right. Let me just check that everything is okay, actually. Oh, Daniel, is everything okay? Just making sure everyone's very quiet. Yeah, it is all wonderful. Right. All right, all right, just checking. 
<clears throat> now, another case, for example, uh, we can keep more interesting types of state. We might want to keep a sequence of elements, not just one. For example, we would, might want a sliding window. In that case, uh, we need a queue. Now, what does a queue do? We need to be able to add to the queue, remove from the queue, and to check its size, because we need a window of a certain size. Now, how would we do this thing? We want a sliding window transducer. The window has a size, and it has a stagger or step distance. In the beginning, we will need to create an instance of a queue. And this is where I said there will be a tiny, tiny bit of Java. And this is an instance of a queue with capacity n, where n is the width of the window. And what's interesting in our step function, we add the input to the queue. Then we check if we have reached the desired size for the queue, where the size is the width of the window. If we have, we copy the content of the queue and create a vector. Then once we have copied it, we can remove step elements from the queue, which is what we need to do. And then we can continue the process with uh, where we have accumulated the new result. Now, if we have not yet reached the size of the window, we don't know we don't want the partial accumulation of the window, so we actually don't modify the accumulator yet. Now, how it looks in practice, I want to create a sliding window of width three, step one, over a range of 10 numbers. And this is what it looks like. As you can see, the difference between each of these windows is just one element over. So we have a view of sliding windows over the range. Any questions about the sliding window? Excellent. Oh, I, I have a... oh please. Yeah, I have a question. So um, can this sliding window function be implemented uh, using uh, closure constructs? I, f I feel like this uh, array uh, queue thing, um, I don't know, it seems like closure already has uh, data structures that would allow for replicating this behavior. It does, it has a persistent queue. This is just oh. a, an optimization. Honestly. Oh, I see. Yeah. But you could use a persistent queue if you wanted to do this. Yeah, that would be good for just, you know, doing an enclosure script as well. Yeah, but the problem with using a persistent queue here mm -hmm. is that you will have to wrap it with a reference like an atom or a volatile. Ah. Uh, and then I you'll see. have to manage the reference as well because you will need to mutate it in <coughs> steps. Yes. Okay. And, and this is where, for example, transducers are slightly more complicated than using loops because if you implemented it with a loop, it won't be as difficult. So this is why those things are usually better off living inside a library. I see. Now, now we've seen how to build our transducers. We understand how transducers are made. 
how the sausage gets made, how do we use them? Like we've seen, we have transduce. Transduce is a very general purpose API. Uh, it decomplex processing from accumulation and iteration is handled by the reduce API. So you just need some function that knows how to accumulate something that can be reduced over and you can hand it off to transduce and transduce will do whatever you tell it. Into is slightly less generic and it will conj or conj bang into the sync collection through the transducer. All right, this is another arity which was added to into. Now, how does this work? It just takes conj and calls the transducer on it, thus wrapping it. Then you get new behavior and you can accumulate into the sync collection with the new accumulator function. <clears throat> now, a couple of more interesting functions. One is sequence. Now, sequence is sort of like the map equivalent of transduce. It takes a transducer and a collection. We've seen examples of, map of sequence before, and it returns a lazy sequence of the transducer applied to the elements, right? Where with map, we, only, we were only able to apply uh, a function to elements with sequence, we get back a lazy sequence, but we are free to not only map a function over it, but we can filter that sequence, we can uh, partition it, we can do everything we want while still getting the map-like behavior. And like map, it also takes multiple uh, sequences as arguments. And then the function will take all the, uh, a cross section from all the sequences. Generally, I think it actually takes everything which is iterable, which is pretty strong. <clears throat> now, now, another function I really like is eduction. And eduction is sort of like a peak laziness because it's not doing anything. What it does, it returns something which is reducible. It is a promise of an application of a transducer to a collection, but it doesn't actually do it. Sequence returns a lazy sequence, but deduction just implements the interface for reducing. Now, the good and the bad is that the transducer will be applied to the collection possibly multiple times every time you call reduce on the deduction. The plus is that nothing is allocated and nothing is called until you call reduce. Right? Nothing runs, nothing is cached, nothing is, uh, it's pretty lightweight. <clears throat> and it also has a nice side effect that they compose arbitrarily with each other. But again, there's no caching. So if you accidentally use the same eduction twice, uh, you will, I'm sorry, someone was at the door. If you use the same eduction twice, then it will be computed twice. <clears throat> now, uh, one use case where I like uh, using deduction is with concatting sequences and nested sequences. Now, building up some arbitrary sequences, for example, I have a sequence of nested sequence of numbers, of symbols, and keywords. Right? Those are my X's, Y's, and Z's. Now, if I wanted to concatenate all of them, this is how I would do it using concat. And this is perfectly 
a legit way of concatenating an arbitrary number of sequences. Now, concat doesn't have a transducer uh, arity, but it has a, an equivalent transducer, which is called cat. Now, where you would write concat like this, and this is the result you'd get. The cat transducer works very similarly, but it doesn't, uh, it, it needs the sequences to be packed together, right? And this is how it would look. And again, you're getting the same result. Same with the induction. But the uh, opposite is that you don't need to apply concat in the case where they're already packed. So uh, you know, six of one, half dozen of the other. I have a quick question. <clears throat> yes, please. Uh, in the case of the uh, induction uh, version of uh, yes in here, uh, I see that the result prints immediately. Uh, doesn't that go against the principle of induction, which is uh, that it's not evaluated right away, if I understand correctly? But I evaluated it. I told it to print. Oh, OK. I see. OK, thank you. Now, same thing I wrote before, but with induction. Now, just I didn't want to repeat myself too much, so I slammed induction and cat together to produce a conduction. And this looks very similar to what we've seen previously, right? Here we had concat of apply concat, apply concat, apply concat. Here we have a conduction of a sequence of more eductions. And the result looks the same, right? So why bother? Why even do that? because the performance benefits are pretty cool. I used count here to get a good sense of how much time this takes. This isn't a very accurate benchmark, but it gives us a ballpark of what we're talking about. Now, since eduction is so lightweight, it's not even counted. I can't call count on it. So I kind of had to implement my own count and use reduce to, uh, to count my eduction because I have no other way of doing it. So this is just my uh, fake uh, count implementation. And even using longs, which is slightly slower than using ints, this is five times faster than using concat. Same implementation, just instead of concat, using eductions. And here we have certainly realized all of the collection because we called count. And if you're familiar with how concat works and how apply works, you'll find that um, concat and apply concat kind of clash with uh, laziness, actually. And this is one case where we can avoid it, for example. And you can see that we save up on some significant cost we can just concatenate arbitrary sequences we haven't even realized yet. So this is how you would use eductions, for example. <clears throat> now, things which work with transducers, we just uh, as a final overview, or you know, just summarizing it, besides collections, channels, 
pipelines, reducers, and anything which is reducible can participate in this uh, dance of transducers. Now, one thing I haven't touched on is performance. And transducers give us a pretty significant performance boost uh, in comparison to chained sequence operations, mainly due to two reasons. One is that we can save a lot on allocations. Why? Sequence operations like map and filter will produce intermediary lazy sequences. Um, if the input is chunked, the uh, resulting lazy sequence will be chunked as well. And let's assume, for example, that the input is chunked. Every step of this computation will allocate an array holding 32 lazy values. So one more step, one more chunk of values which are allocated. Sequence will produce only one chunked lazy sequence, which encompasses the entire computation. And as you can see, this implementation, right, thread lasts through one sequence operation, second sequence operation, third sequence operation, just maps to comp of these uh, transducers now. And then we have only one lazy sequence instead, intermediary lazy sequence instead of three. Now, if we used eduction, there would be no intermediate uh, sequences. If we use transduce, neither. Here, eduction is only one allocation and it doesn't even allocate anything until we consume it, until we reduce over it. Transduce will only allocate depending on the reducing function and in it. If, for example, this would be sending it over the network, we will not uh, allocate the resulting sequence at all, right? The elements will just be sent over the network one by one. So in any use case, transducers will reduce uh, allocation pressure and different APIs give us more choice regarding uh, laziness and allocation profile. And allocation, like the, the JVM is really good at allocating things, but it's not free. So this is basically good for us. Another reason is JIT compilation. The JVM is a bytecode interpreter, but it has an excellent just-in-time, which is JIT, compiler. And it is very good at optimizing nested class method calls. And in case you don't know, functions in Clojure are class instances, and calling them is just invoking some method they all implement. So when you create a hierarchy of nested functions and you keep it, if you keep it around, you give the just-in-time compiler something that it, it really likes and knows how to optimize. So just like the JIT will be able to optimize this way better than it will be able to optimize this, I'm not talking about lazy sequences for a second. So will this implementation, right? Because we have here, well, comp returns a function, which is just some new structure. It's, it's one object. 
it will be faster than this, just because the JVM will be way better at inlining and flattening and optimizing this. And unlike with map, yeah, you're going to say, gee, Ben, this is pretty useless. I, I can just close over all the functions. I don't need to use your fancy transducers. But you can't mix other functions like that. And you can with transducers. Right? If you have this sequence operation, you map one function, then you filter with another, then you partition, then you map a new function, then, then you filter again. You might have written such operations. The JVM will have a pretty hard time optimizing it. But if you use the transducer arity and you return just one function, right now you have this transducer you have saved aside. The JVM can optimize it to its heart content and it will do a damn good job at doing it. So by the way, this is another thing worth mentioning regarding transducers. If they're static, right? If they're not dependent on inputs, def them. They, if you def them, they will get compiled. The class they get compiled to will be kept around and the JVM will be able to optimize it again and again as it encounters it again. Uh, otherwise you're running the risk of just creating a new instance every call and that's just wasteful. Now, something I didn't mention in the slides, I didn't really touch on was reducing functions, but uh, West did ask uh, something regarding it. You can accumulate everything and you can do some pretty interesting things at the uh, final steps. You can, um, you can accumulate several values and perhaps combine them when you're done. All of those things are uh, things you can play around with. Or for example, building strings, right? You can build a string using a string builder instead of uh, using stir. And then you have a mutable accumulator. That's the uh, transient version of building strings. So this was the presentation. I hope you had fun. And <laughs> uh, now is time for questions. And I will be, make sure to uh, correct the uh, slides where I missed the bindings. So please, questions, uh, feel free. I have a question about using uh, transducers. Um, how is it that you can build up um, more complex uh, groupings of functions and, and um, capture intermediate values and build your pipeline step by step? Could you? I, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, to understand exactly what what you're uh, aiming the question at. So what I was wondering is, in terms of my thought of how to learn to use transducers, it's been unclear to me how I can build up a complex um, pipeline step by step. If I can't capture intermediate values and see what's happening as I'm building it, I don't understand how I can get to the complexity that I would want. Well. To start with, and this is a pretty simple heuristic and it also uh, sort of a jumping off point to uh, John's work. Every place where you use thread last with let's say core 
uh, with core sequence functions. You can just substitute that with a transducer. That, that's the first step. And then you might find, for example, that you have one function where you've done that, and you have another function where you've done that. So A, you might be able to just pull out the transducers from both of them. And like in the end, you might end up with just uh, like, here's a transducer where I pulled out, and here's another transducer where I pulled out. And for example, you called transduce on that transducer and transduce on that transducer. But those are just two steps where you can merge into one again, right? And you can just start pulling things apart and just removing the sequence from the equation. And you'll find that those pipelines sort of build themselves up, right? They, they naturally emerge from the ground up. You don't design them top down. You, you, you start your modeling, right? And you start your design with a sequence. And then later you say, oh, okay, I've built up my sequences. Now I want to gain the efficiency and all the goodness involving transducers. So I'll just uh, rewrite it with thread last, and then I will uh, replace thread last with comp and you're good to go. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Thank you. How would you uh, implement recursion in with transducers? Or is it not possible? It's not possible. You can only uh, implement, uh, like I said, and I made sure to, to be accurate where I wrote this in the slides, you can only implement linear recursive processes with transducers. Although, if you want to get crazy, you can probably create named functions in the, uh, in the transistors and try to recur with them. But good, good luck to you. I'm not responsible to, uh, to what happens. They, they are mostly for linear processes, right? Not for trees and stuff like that. But if you, if you find a way, to make it work decently for trees, I'm interested. Thanks. Maybe I'll just comment that uh, we have 10 minutes before the official time of the end. And that it doesn't mean we cannot stay afterwards, uh, just for those who need to leave. Yeah. Um, it would be great to have more questions. That was an amazing uh, presentation. Pretty awesome, Ben. Uh, question, you showed us that completable futures implementation. Um, yeah. And yeah. you know, uh, you touched upon how that's like one of many possible transducing contexts or transducing processes, right? And yes. If people wanted to just go forth and, and make more of those transducing contexts or processes, what can they keep in mind? What should they be looking for? Uh, how can they find those? Contexts? The only question you need to ask yourself if you do it is how do I reduce over it? Right? The second you figure out how you reduce over it, you can transduce over it. So here I extended the reduce protocol to completable future. And then I can reduce over completable future, given that the initial values are valid, et cetera, some terms and conditions. But Java util concurrent flow, figure out how to make it reducible. And suddenly you can transduce over it. <clears throat> Thanks for the presentation. Um, quick question on my side is you said you can nest transducers together, right? You can compose transducers. Right. Could you compose eductions and transducers so that you have 
some transducer segments that are repeatedly invoked every time and some that are not or not? Hmm. You could, you have, you'd have to be like careful and exercise some care. But if, for example, you close over an eduction mm -hmm. before you instantiate the transducer and in the transducer itself, you return the eduction, then maybe that way. Okay. I, I, I think it's possible. You'll just have to be uh, pretty cautious when you implement uh, it. When you say cautious, you mean you may lose the eduction property or some other problem? No, just go through it very slowly and oh, make right. sure you code review it. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Um, I have a quick question, uh, Matt. I asked you earlier uh, about the async uh, yes. portion of your of your slides. I'm sorry, I don't recall the the exact functions, but basically, uh, I know that pipeline is definitely uh, uh, a uh, async uh, requirements because of the threading to uh, to different channels. But uh, how about the other functions, um, like even async reduce? Uh, could, could they have been implemented uh, just with a regular closure core transducer? Um, uh, I know I could go in, look into the code, but yes, I well, uh, yes, I, I looked, I looked into the code, so I can answer the question. Um, you. You can't use reduce. You say implement it using closure core reduce, but if you look at how reduce works, reduce checks if the uh, objects it's reducing implement the reduce interface oh, or protocol. Yeah, okay, I understand and that. It works through them. So if channels implemented the reduce uh, interface or protocol, then you would be able to call closure core reduce on them. Sure, I understand. Thank you. Uh, ben, that was beautiful. And I'm tempted, I wish to ask so many questions, but I'll ask one. And that is, uh, would you like to say anything more about how we can practice at home, what we could explore further, and maybe keep <coughs> discussing it in the coming days? Well, first, I provide in the repo, like I said, a skeleton uh, of the implementations you have seen in the presentation. So if you want to convince yourselves that it actually works and you want to get a feel for it uh, with your own two hands, and so you can just take the slides and take the, the file and start going through the steps of the implementation yourselves until you feel all right, here, I got this. This is how it works. These are the elements. These are the steps because I left room for all the steps uh, that I went through in the presentation. So you can work through it. And I also have uh, an extra section in the uh, repo with some other questions, other discussions, and a small, small exercise. Like here, take this example, refactor it, use transducers, um, just to get slightly a better feel for it. I have a question about the design. Um, let's say you have a, a pipeline of, of uh, 25, 30, an insane high number of functions to uh, compose and they definitely are uh, a good target for transducer. Uh, how, how would you uh, structure your code? W would you uh, structure it so that all of the uh, elements, uh, the functions that are being composed are visible at a glance? 
uh, even if they're across namespaces, or would you, I guess, it's dependent on the context, but uh, do, do you have any thought on that? Would, would you uh, aggregate them into higher level functions? And, uh, and any, uh, any suggestions about the debugging uh, transducers on that scale? Thank you. Yes. Um, well, one thing to remember about transducers is that they are well behaved under composition. And what I mean by well behaved, you don't have to put all 25 steps in one place. You can put the, the, st the steps themselves where they belong logically, right? For example, in, in their own namespaces. And if, for example, the same five steps, some five steps belong together, so they are in that namespace. And from that namespace, you expose a transducer, the composition of only those five steps. And then in another place, you can take all those larger transducers and compose them again. Because like I said, that composition is well behaved. Just like you can add numbers and you don't have to keep all the numbers in one place, you don't have to keep all the transducers in one place to create one huge chain. And this also makes uh, testing easier, right? You don't have to test the big chain and that's it. You can break them up to small chains and test them. Now, if you want to test them, you can just feed them into, I think the easiest option would be to feed them into sequence, right? Sequence just it behaves sort of like map. So you build your mock uh, input sequence. You take the small transducer, the one that you want to check and you call sequence on it and check that it actually works. And you can build a sequence of one element. And this is like the easiest way to check. Uh, you, know, you don't want to, to create very convoluted test cases. Okay, thank you. Welcome. We're getting close to the end. Uh, so, let us see if anybody wants to say anything brief before we end the recording. And then Ben, maybe you would like to kind of conclude the session. And then those who wish to stay can stay. Yeah, I'll have a quick call out. Um, next week, one week from today, I'll be giving a presentation on ingest. And um, as Ben was saying, uh, you can think of composing transducers as being similar to building a thread last pipeline. And ingest just makes it easier for you to do that, compose transducers using a pipeline formalism. Um, and this video is very much a precursor to that one. So if you want to attend that one, please do review this video. And um, yeah, looking forward to seeing you. Um, oh, please. Hmm. All right. So, um, I was, I was thinking, I usually like to, um, learn just from example. Um, I'm wondering how I can find, uh, transducers being used in the wild, so to speak, like, um, you know, I can give you an example. I think the, uh, the uh, the Babashka n REPL is extended via uh, transducers, hmm. if I recall correctly. Ah, so there you have an example in the wild. Yeah, but you, you might also uh, get at least some feel for it from um, uh, from the exercises I provide with the repo. So I think these two together should probably have you covered, but if not, just ping me on Zulip or Slack and I'll scrounge up some examples. All right, thank you. Cheers. Wonderful, thank you so much. And now maybe Ben, your conclusion, if you can. And... Yes, some closing remarks. Uh, transducers are the best thing since sliced bread. Uh, 
love them to death and they're really great the and a bit more seriously you you can really see both the performance improvements and the let's say code quality improvements when you bring them in you see cleaner code they also uh, sort of help you clear up your own thinking about it because you have to think about the computation you're doing and not about the concrete sequence of elements so they, they force you to think slightly differently so cleaner code better performance um, clearer thinking i think they're really a big plus and i'm pretty thankful for the closure team and for bringing them to the world so thanks rich and alex who's actually here and um yeah i'll make sure to correct uh, the slight oversight i've left in the slides and thank you daniel for putting all those workshops together you're doing pretty hard work here so kudos and see i hope to see you all later in the in reclosure i'll also be giving a talk about performance so thank you all for attending and thank you daniel and the organizers for all the very hard work you're putting in <laughs>